Hi, Jerry. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, Tashin. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank mm. you for the invitation. Well, um, just to set a little context for folks who maybe don't know Jerry, uh, Jerry and I met at my alma mater, St. John's College. Uh, gosh, I guess it would have been about 14 years ago that we would have met. And Jerry was a mental health counselor there when I was there. And I saw him, I think, every week when I was there for all four years is my memory. Uh, and we got okay, really close. Champ. What's that? You're the champ. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if they had a valedictorian for such things, that would be you. I got the the gold the gold badge, but um, that's what I was going for. But um, Which yeah, is we got the, the healthiest cat out there. Uh, uh, yeah, so we saw each other every weekend, got quite close and have been friends since then. And I wanted to dive deeper into Jerry's life and his work and kind of get to know him in this venue. And uh, yeah, so I'll start by asking the question I ask everyone, which is, you know, what is your life story? And for me, this this question is a foundation of this podcast, because I think people are so um, complex and interesting to me. And every person is a world unto themselves and has this whole depth and complexity that I think the the autobiographical details of someone's life really um, begins to get at that, who they are, what they've been through, what they've seen. And then, you know, when we connect that to the specifics of their life's work and what they've chosen to do with their with their time, I think it, you know, they're often like really interesting connections and it just sort of frames the field of who is this person and, you know, what, what makes them tick and that kind of thing. So we'd love to hear from you, anything that you'd like to share about your life story. You can answer at any length that you like in any way that you want, short, long, this way, that way, it's all good. But would love to hear yeah. from you about your life. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, I grew up in New York um, on Long Island, and um, I was kind of a. I guess my childhood was I was a child in the '60s, that decade, and the '70s was come my coming of age, decade. I guess you could say, um, and uh, I was. Uh, both parents were teachers. I was one of five kids. I was in a town that was very Irish Catholic. Um, my dad was the kid of Polish immigrants, my mom, Italian immigrants. And in those days, that was a mixed marriage, kind of controversial to both of their families. <laughs> but in those days, that's the way it was. And um, they forged ahead for love and produced all of us. And in our little town, um, five kids was not a big family. It was six, seven, eight kids is the norm. In fact, the people across the street from us had 12. Wow. And just a couple of blocks was the biggest family that had 16. Wow. So, they, and, you know, same mom, same father, if you can imagine how that would work. Whew. Wow. Um, yeah. So, you know, five kids in the Januszewski house. I, I imagine people were like, oh, they only have five. Oh, that's so sad. Um, that's the kind of mentality that it was. But it was a, it was a good town. Uh, it was a... a uh, I, we were involved with the Catholic Church. It was a profound influence on all of us. Very positive. I don't have any terrible stories to tell. I had very good relationships with nuns and priests, and they were either very kind to me or neutral. You know, there was never anything bad. Um, and I had a I had a great sense of security being under this gigantic umbrella of Catholicism, which was that town. Um, I went to public school mostly. I went to one year of Catholic school, but mostly public school in the adjoining town, which was half Jewish, half um, non-Jewish, Catholic and Protestant. Um, it was it was delightful environment as I look back. Um, no, very few ethnic groups other than those, than the, the Eastern and Western European ethnic groups. Um, there were no blacks in our town. There were in other towns nearby, but... Um, there was a lot of segregation, I guess you could say. Um, we didn't understand any of that, you know. Um, I played basketball, a lot of sports. Both my parents were teachers and coaches, and sports, sports, sports was the thing. Um, I couldn't imagine my life without it. It was the major focus of everything. Uh, so I grew up that way. I was the second oldest of five, three sisters and a brother, and um, we're very close five siblings today we fought like mad back then but um i think my parents did something right in the way they helped us to be together and so 
when when all five of us are together, it is the funniest side splitting event that you could have. And we just really enjoy each other's company. Um, and I and I admire my siblings a lot. They're very kind people who do do good in the world. Um, so that was that was growing up, and uh, I. It was also the era of, uh, you know, the stormy political events of those of that era, the sixties and seventies, and I was very much aware of things like the Vietnam War, and I was just a little too young to have to register and potentially be drafted. I was born in fifty eight, and um, and the war ended in seventy five, and that would have made me seventeen, and uh, it was you know moving along uh, and it was scary uh, and and I wasn't sure what I would have to do if it was still going on so uh, that also informed I think a kind of urgency that I've always felt about um, doing something important and useful in the world uh, and it became a source of tension because I don't know if you know how much the agreement there is in, in the in the cultural history of the United States, but from my perspective, when I graduated high school in 1976, from then on, you know, disco, like people were sick and tired of the uh, of the tension of idealism. You might say. I think a lot of people were, maybe not everybody. And so there was this like cutting loose, and and you went to college because you were supposed to, you wanted to get a job and make money, and and that launched us into the Reagan era, I suppose. Um, so I had I was very idealistic, and so on the on the scale of idealism to cynicism, maybe I, I'm way over on the idealistic side, and I always have been, and and I'm kind of okay with. I, I don't think it's been naive, and maybe at times, but I think uh, um, I felt very sad to people who we when we were idealistic together, and and they would sort of lose that interest. For example. I went to my 10 year high school reunion, 1986. And um, the people, everyone, everyone was working on Wall Street, you know, like, uh, and, and not that that's evil, you know, but um, it was so opposite to what, what we were thinking, you know, and, and I remember this particular guy and we were buddies and he was, he was way more out there than I was as far as protesting and things like that. And, and he was working on Wall Street as he had long hair in high school and now and I was like, you too, man, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on here? And he, he said something like, oh, I bet I made more money in a month than you make in a year, <laughs> something like that, which really discouraged me big time. Um, and so that's, and that's, that was sort of that transitionary period in the late seventies, early eighties, it was like that. Um, I went to college because I didn't have anything else to do and I was supposed to. And, you know, like a lot of people, I had no clue what to do. And when I signed up for course, courses at some university, I went to uh, all the introductory courses, there was a space to put, to declare a major. And I had not any idea what to study. How can you, when you're 18, I don't think. Um, and so I put, I just picked one of the classes that I had there and it was philosophy, intro, introductory philosophy introduction and i didn't had no interest in philosophy <laughs> at all <laughs> i was interested in in basketball and girls probably and um but that's what i wrote down and so there we were living in a dorm you know figuring that out like I, like people do and uh people were we were in this common area and people were talking about their majors right and i was amazed that people were so like i'm a business major i'm a biology major and and seemingly certain about what they were doing, which was just lost on me how that could be. And I wasn't really paying a whole lot of attention, but then I was on the periphery of that and someone yells out, hey, JJ, uh, what's your major? And I was like, oh, I guess philosophy, <laughs> like, I guess, you know, <laughs> and they go, and that got the biggest laugh, Tashin, than you can imagine. <laughs> like there could not have been a more worthless thing to major in than philosophy at that time, hmm. you know? And the, there, was, there was a guy there who had a major in traffic safety who didn't get laughed at as much as I got laughed at. Huh. So that was kind of the scene. And uh, I didn't know why I wanted to be in school. And I 
dropped out after a couple of years. I just, I didn't, I wanted to drop out after the first semester, but my parents were nervous. They were, de- you know, depression era people. Um, the only re- way my dad ever went to college was through the GI Bill. You know, he had been in the service, World War II and the Korean War. And the idea of not going to college was uh, the most dreadful thing to them. So I stayed in as long as I could. I did okay, but I didn't know what I was doing, very lack direction. So I stopped and worked and took courses here and in and out, in and out, in and out, and didn't have any real idea of anything. And then I went to visit a friend of mine at a, at a university he went to and had so much fun that I just said, oh, I'm going here, man. <laughs> Nothing to do with intellectual pursuits. So um, I show up at this school and um, it was uh, it was fantastic. I was being challenged. It was it was Cornell University in New York. It was it was taking uh, it just took so much and I was never not for the first time not playing a sport which is like a full-time job when you're in college to play a sport like these guys that play in March Madness that's what they do most of the time, you know, and if they get to class sometimes, that's an achievement. Um, so we had this time and I'm studying and and I, I physically I was just changing still and and I could feel my brain was was being altered. It felt almost physical too. For example, I, you know, video games, which everyone, you know, young men especially really like today still. Um, back then to play a video game, you had to go to an arcade and nobody had any money. So we we're like saving our quarters, like precious things. And we'd all go to the arcade together and just have a lot of fun. Well, oh, I, so abruptly, it may have been a matter of weeks, but it felt like almost instantaneously, my brain shifted and I could not play video games without getting a headache. Hmm. I just wanted to read. Instead, I didn't like looking at the screen or spending any money doing that or do you know, it was like distasteful. And uh, I didn't understand it at the time. My friends were like, what are you doing? What? You're not doing this with us? What are you talking about? You know, but, and I look at it now and I was like, that was remarkably good thing that happened. And maybe it was just the natural growth of a human body and brain. Um, but I had a second one also at St. John's College, Tashin. Um, When I first got there, I was 32. And again, and maybe it was just the intellectual environment where people really valued study and saw it as almost a spiritual pursuit to to seek truth and live by it, you know. And it really appealed to me. And I, and there was so uh, and maybe that was my idealistic side, but I my body responded to this in in ways that I I, I I'm so grateful. And I like where would I be without that? I don't know. So. Um, Anyway, uh, when I first got to that that university where they eventually graduated from Cornell, um, wonderful place, awesome place. I would ex- recommend it to anybody. Um, if you would ask me then, what my um, was I did I believe what I believe in, I probably would have said something like, I am spiritual but not religious, you know. I did not consider myself Roman Catholic, although I really liked Jesus, liked him a lot. What was not to like? Um, and I wanted to be more like that. I, I didn't, he was brave. I was not brave. He was smart. I didn't feel smart. He was wise and knew what to do. He could handle people. I didn't feel any of those things. And really desired to develop that way, but I didn't know how. Um, so that's how I would have described myself. But if in reality, the, the guiding principle of my life was probably shrewdness. I wanted to be shrewd. I didn't, I'd been taken advantage of like most of us have in relationships. And I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be the fool. I didn't want to play the fool. I had when in between colleges, I worked, you know, at crappy jobs and I didn't want to be beholden to rich people. You know, I didn't necessarily want to just strive for riches, but I didn't I wanted to be in a little more command of what was my life was about, I guess. And, um, and that was really the guiding principle shrewdness. And it didn't stop me from being what I would now see as dishonesty, you know, taking advantage of situations if I could. Um, 
without guilt. And so uh, that was the guiding principle. And so there I was at this new place, and I had what I would consider the first spiritual experience. <laughs> Probably many things could be called a spiritual experience if it shifts your 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 orientation in life. But uh, this is one I recognize as such. I was it was a Saturday afternoon in the fall. I was there just I had been there a month or two, you know. Um, I'm I'm just killing time in the dorm room. I hear some guy at the door. A guy lives down the hall. Hey, JJ, uh, you want to go make 25 bucks for two hours work? I'm like, yeah, hell yeah. And okay, at that time, Tashin, minimum wage, I think was $3 an hour, you know, maybe less. And so 25 bucks for two hours work was good money, definitely in. So we go off and and I didn't even care what it was. I said, on the way, I said, what are we going to be doing? He goes, we're going to be selling t-shirts at the Cars concert. Now, you, I don't know if you remember the Cars, the late 70s rock band that was big. You know, they're playing big arenas, right? So there we were. We get, we, we're congregated with the, the boss man who has all the t-shirts and he's got big boxes of t-shirts and each of us gets a box and each t-shirt cost $5, which was not cheap in those days. And he said, uh, okay, now, when so, you're going to run out of extra large t-shirts first. So when you run out of extra large t-shirts and someone wants one, you reach into the box with two hands, grab the t-shirt with one hand and the tag with the other, and you pull out the t-shirt, thus ripping off the tag and tell them it's extra large. Hmm. Okay. That was the sales technique, you know? Um, and you know, okay, I'm cool with that. We're going, it turns out we were just totally bootlegged. Like all the merchandise was controlled by the band in the arena. And we're walking around outside the arena, people on long lines already waiting to figure out to get in. I am selling t-shirts, man, like nobody's business. People are crowding around me. I'm grabbing $5 bills. I got a fistful of money and I'm running out of t-shirts. And I have no more extra large t-shirts. And some guy says, extra large. And he's putting up the money. And I did the maneuver that this guy recommended. And and I give it, and the guy goes off. And I felt what I now recognize as guilt. I did not know what that was at the time. I felt bad. Thought to myself, that feels bad. And probably a week before I'd had a conversation with a Christian guy who, and I very sincerely asked him, how do you know the difference between right and wrong? And he said, um, if I'm considering an action and I don't know whether it's right and wrong, I ask myself two questions. Is this pleasing to God? And does this glorify God? Hmm. And pleasing to God, I can understand. Glorifying God seemed like the high-handed religious talk I was getting away from. I didn't know what that meant, and I didn't care, honestly. But the, the other part I did, and so when I felt this after selling this T-shirt fraudulently, I, I gave myself a little time out. I went off to the side, and I was trying to sort through my feelings, and I remembered that conversation with the guy. Is this pleasing to God? Is this glorifying to God? Still not understanding glorifying to God as a psycho or religious babble kind of thing um and i and i said to myself no way is this pleasing to god no freaking way and way and and un very uncharacteristic of me at the time i took everything i went back to the boss man gave him the box gave him all the money didn't want anything and i said and he was like dumbfounded I, I the big wad of money and looked like it's been going very well and he said what are you what are you doing man and i said look i don't want to do this and he said why not and i tashin i do not know where these words came from i did not i would not have said such a thing normally i just said it's not honest and i even get a tingle right now it was like something happened you know and he just and he, he like did this on my cheek and he goes, ah, oh, you're going to learn someday, you know? And so I walked, I left and I'm walking back to the dorm 
and I am all of a sudden in some ecstatic kind of thing going on. I feel like I'm walking on air. And I'd never had this experience before. Um, I was just flying and, you know, a absolutely sober, you know. Um, and I get back to the uh, dorm room and my roommate was not there. And I had, you know, we had records at the time, not tapes or CDs or anything like that. We had a bunch of records there. I just put one on and the one on the top was Beethoven symphonies. I don't even remember what symphony it was, but all of a sudden the, the music just filled the air. I was, and I'm like, in retrospect, I'm like, was that like synthesia kind of experience? I don't know. I didn't think so for a long time, but I'm like, just, it was almost like I could see it, you know, like this music was just sort of in complete, consistent harmony with what I was feeling. And I didn't know what to make of that, except that I wanted more and I wanted that. And I thought to myself at the time, it was not, not any more complicated than this. I wanted, if something's pleasing to God, it helps me. I want to do that, you know? Not much changed for me then for a while until the following spring. And I, um, we're on spring break and I went down to see my folks and I'm walking, going to New York City and I'm walking around New York City, spring day, gorgeous, walking around New York on a cool, beautiful spring day is one of the nicest things you could ever do. And I'm walking around just loving life, you know? And this guy walks next to me and says, and he's a workman, and he's got this big box on his shoulder. And he's talking to me and he said, hey, how's your faith? I was like, what? what? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm good. I'm not good. Um, and, he had, he, and he said, oh, and I looked at it. He was wearing a T-shirt. T-shirts come in and out of my life. And on the T-shirt, it said Shekinah. Shekinah, S-H-I-N-K. Anyway, I can figure it out. Shekinah. I'd never seen that word. I said, what's that word? Shekinah. And he goes, it's the glory of God. I'm like, oh, there's that word, glory. Um, I said, but what is it? He says, glory of God manifest on the earth. With you, maybe. Oh, got to go. And he makes a 90 degree turn, gone. And I'm like, oh, tingly. Like, what's going on? Like, that was important. And so these things started happening. And, that, and, and so I think there was some in me at that time then. I was like, I don't care. I think I was so starved for anything that you could really stand on. This idea that there was God and there was God's will. And it was glorious. And it had something to do with God's presence with me. Um, and I thought to myself, I don't care whether someone calls whatever I'm thinking spiritual or religious or cuckoo. Um, it's too splendid to worry about that, <laughs> you know? And that's and that sent me in a direction that was extremely uh, important and formative for me. And over the next year, there was a series of moments that I felt like I was being drawn towards a life of faith. That and 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 I know this sounds a little weird, but being rewarded for it. And I don't. It's not like I deserve to be rewarded for it. I wasn't doing anything. I was being as blithely idiotic and savage as there as I ever was when I was selling those T-shirts. It wasn't like I was being Mr. Good Guy in any sense. Um, so I wasn't being rewarded for good behavior, but something was being very rewarding was coming to me. And I don't know, I don't know to this day why me and not this guy over there or that guy over there, you know, um, it seemed, it seemed somewhat random to me. Um, so things changed for me radically around that time. Like the things that I pursued um, in life just shifted big time because I thought anything that doesn't contribute to this path I'm on is, is expendable. You know, this is just too much, you know, too important to let something petty or petty 
uh, that I anything I wanted before that like the things I did want before seemed thin, watery, and uh, and so uh, life took on a whole different character after that. Um, and probably it was maybe another year and a half after that moment with that guy in New York City that um, had another major, to me, seismic kind of level of shift of my life. Whereas I was sort of being pulled along by something very sweet. And it was a sense of presence of something soul warming. I don't know. I, I know it sounds very abstract, but that's it, it was very hard to internet to this day to describe it clearly. But I'm I'm being drawn to something that's loving and beautiful and be with me, you know, something with me. So um, I'm aware as I say this, it may even sound nutty to anyone who's listening to this, but I, so be it, you know. Um, I was going to a party. I was staying, still in that town, Ithaca, New York, still going to school, still trying to finish. And um, I had a job and the people at the job had a big party. I went to the party. This was uh, um, in the evening, one evening. And um, it was... It was fun. You know, at this point, though, I was not drinking, not doing any drugs whatsoever because of this thing that was going on with me. And I don't know what it was even. I don't know what to call it. Um, and uh, the, it was, in fact, I tried with my very limited vocabulary to describe it to people. And I remember standing with some guy and I'm saying something new is happening to me. New. It's not the old stuff, you know. Because uh, and he's listening and he's like, not sure what to make of this. And some second guy comes over and he's and, and he's he's listening too now. And I'm trying to say this, and the second guy says to the first guy, "What's he talking about?" <laughs> and the and the first guy says, "Oh, it's the something new religion," hmm. you know? <laughs> which made me laugh. But uh, I guess that was the best I could come up with at the time. And um, anyway, so I'm at this party and I did not know what was going on, but there was some girl there that liked me um, and her friends thought we should be together. They arranged this thing. We're in a room with everyone together. All of a sudden, everyone's gone except me and her, right? And she's saying seductive things, right? Not that I was Joe hot or desirable, believe me, uh, but... This, this is what happens here in college, right? So um, I was not interested. Uh, and not because I didn't have a sex drive, but I was just so completely enamored with what was happening to me, you know? And I tried to tell this to her. I tried to explain this to her. And, um, and she's like thinking, I'm absolutely out of my mind. Like you are, what is wrong with you, you know? And then I left, right? And Tash and I remember describing what I just did, that little story to this woman when I was in Ireland. This it was like a 75-year-old woman was asking me about these experiences. And I described it. And she thought that was the funniest thing she had ever heard. She goes, what kind of dolt were you? <laughs> and I was like, hey, you're right. You know, I could get that. Because um, that's just where I was, you know. And you got to roll, roll with it. And I was wanted to do what was true. Anyway, uh, so I left that party and it's probably one or two in the morning. Again, completely sober. It's in upstate New York in the summertime. At night, it gets cool. You know, it's not hot all the time. And it was a very cool, brisk kind of walk home, but I was loving it, like feeling the, the, the coolness. And there were a lot of people still out and about. And, I, and um, all of a sudden, man, I had an experience that of the former ecstasies multiplied where all of a sudden something was coming down through me, in me, around me. I felt like I was standing next to, in, on top of, around, in, around me, presence of God. Call me a complete loony if you want to, but this is how I was ex having this experience that was not induced by any other kind of 
substance. Um, and I didn't know what to do with this. I was like, I was like, what's happening to me? What's happening to me? And I started running and it was lovely. It wasn't like I was having a psychotic break and I wanted to go kill somebody. It was quite the opposite. And as I'm running, because my body is like being brought into something, there were people and I wanted to yell at them, hey, you know, God is here. No, not in theory, really here, you know? <laughs> um, I didn't do that. I knew that would be, they'd call the cops and take me to the funny farm. But I, anyway, I ran the rest of the way home, feeling this. I get into bed and I'm like, oh, I hope you're, I'm now addressing, in my mind, God, the Father. I hope you're here tomorrow. <laughs> and I went right out to sleep. I wake up the next morning. Still here, you know? And I had a series of days, I would say seven or eight days, where I was on this other level of experience, of life. And I, I just did not know these kinds of ex ways of being were available to me ever and when you grew up with a religion um that talks about these kinds of things but not the reality for anyone i ever knew you know like a faith helped people kind of persevere but it wasn't like this living thing happening to you dynamic and you cannot be different after this visits you um i was so excited by this and i was willing to then do anything and took to and I was willing at that point then to call myself a Christian. This it was the only uh, label that made sense to me, you know. Um, Jesus and his life and his teachings were so uh, I could almost feel them, you know. And I and I need and I want to eat them, you <laughs> know. And I realize I'm sounding kind of more nutty as I go, but uh, that's was the the sensation of it. Um, very physical feeling, weirdly enough, to call it spiritual, very physical, uh, kind of an experience. Um, and that's been um, a very strong guiding principle in my life. It was nine years later, I show up at St. John's College and uh, did a program there. Um, uh, you know, I'd lived in Boston for a while in between. Uh, I another very formative thing in Boston, I was very discouraged. I did a graduate school thing there at Boston University. Didn't like it, but I did it. And I got a job out of that. And I'm like, oh, if this is the job I have to do for the rest of my life or this kind of thing, I am screwed. And I was very anxious about this. And one of the interesting things to me about it is that you could have these parallel things going on. Like I had this spiritual life that was very satisfying and exciting. It was like falling in love, dynamic. Um, and at the same time, here was this suffering, more or less, that I felt that I didn't know what to do with, you know, and I didn't know necessarily know how it all went together um, all the time. So I was very discouraged about, and and you know, Boston. You've spent some time. You grew up near Boston, right? up and coming city <laughs> like our old city but like people young person city very ambitious people looking good you know um coffee generation or whatever like it's i was not like that i had not the same ambition that people had um and i felt really out of place there and uh, even though i loved boston i didn't i couldn't go with that way of being and if this was the path that i had sort of chosen i'm like i don't know what to do about this well, one day I leave work, it's a beautiful day, um, and I'm walking around downtown around Boston Common, and there was some big church there around the corner, maybe you've seen it, Park Street Church. I had gone there a bunch of times. Uh, I see some people off on the side entrance, like smoking and looking a little bedraggled, you know, and then they go in. And I was like, oh, that's weird, you know, like, even when if church folk smoke, they don't usually smoke at church, you know? <laughs> so that was interesting. And I went in out of pure curiosity. Well, it was an AA meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I just went in, sat down and wanted to experience this. Within 30 to 60 seconds, I was in love with it immediately. Um, I could, for one reason, the spirit of 
We Are All Damaged Goods was very strong. And that was the only place I knew, including with churches, that I could go and really feel that. Like, they didn't give a rat's ass if you had a lot of money, if you had a lot of job, if you had ambitions to be president of the United States. You know, it didn't matter. We were here because we all shared, they, they would say, a common problem. And in that we have fellowship and nobody's better. There's non-hierarchical thinking big time. And I'd not been introduced to that at all before. And this was a, it was a beautiful, but rude awakening, you know, hit me hard. I'm like, this is a beautiful thing in the world that they're doing this. And the 12 steps seem to me to be pure genius and, and it's psychological insight and everything, you know, how it understood, uh, the way life is, you know? And so I start going to this meeting. I did not drink, but I really liked this meeting. And I was going regularly and people were like, hey, you know, like, you know, I'm somewhat tall, 6'4". I'd come in there and they'd say, hey, big guy, uh, come on in. We're all fucked up in here. Come on in, you know? And I really can't tell you how that was salve for my soul. God given, as far as I'm concerned. God gave me this as a gift. Um, knew knew what I was going through in my travails and gave me a, a path out of it, sort of, sort of. And then these people at this meeting would say, um, "Yeah, so what's your story?" Like once I got to know them a little bit, and I'd say, "Well, I don't drink," and they'd be like, "Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure." You know, <laughs> they didn't really believe me, but it was uh, it was uh, really again super important life-changing event for me a shadowy thing i might say tashin um that sort of runs through the story that i haven't commented on has to do with um my relationship with uh, my father and older men in general um my dad and i uh loved each other but we never connected well you know, and he tended to be uh, partly a great guy and partly a monstrous guy. A bad temper, rage, and I and I, my whole life, sought to try to understand him and where this all came from. And I have some thoughts about it, but you know, who knows? It's, it's really actually going to in the end be a mystery. There it is, um, and his. His raging had a lot of, did a lot of damage in our family, um, as well as the good, his good thing did for our family too, you know? Um, and, and if you're a kid in a situation like that, I'm sure you understand this just from being in a spiritual environment, this must come up a lot for you, for people that you know. Um, very confusing for a kid when you have a parent who's, lovable and you want to be with them and yet to be with them is to be uh damaged and so as i grew up and start to make sense like most kids try to figure out when you're confronted with your own suffering is there something wrong with the world or is there something wrong with me and um most kids will say there's something wrong with me for a long time until you I don't know what, how to you get enough ego strength. You can figure yourself out to some point who the me is. And you see that it wasn't something wrong with you that caused a lot of this stuff, this bad stuff. So as I was going through life and trying to figure this out and trying to make peace with him unsuccessfully, as it turns out, for the rest of my life, he's, he's gone now, he's dead. Um, I, I found myself being kind of profoundly disappointed with I don't want to say all but almost all of the men of his generation and and I, and I'm this is still a big issue for me trying to figure it out and and how my spirituality fits into it and what are the what are the redemptive aspects of this kind of suffering I can well imagine and have experienced partly but not sure in total but it seemed to me that the men of my dad's generation, and these are, you know, depression era guys, vital guys, strong, had philosophies of their own, committed their lives to service. They were all teachers and coaches, and they were like really 
in it to help young men grow. You know, they had good motives. Um, but when I got to be an adult and knew all these guys that my dad and all of his circle of guys, I was amazed. It just it seemed to me how thoughtless they were and how random was their inconsiderate behavior. And it was really troubling to me to, uh, and I get, I guess I got a little cynical about that and maybe still am a little bit, um, but it's been part of the, the shadow, I guess that's the best way to put it, the shadowy thing that follows me that I am seeking always to try to figure it out. Um, and if I think of it in a Jungian, Carl Jungian sense, you know, the, there's the, the shadow and shadow work that people will do. And I, I think I spend a lot of time thinking about that, um, talking about that with people, trying to um, be healthy and be free of of things and to see and I and I and if there's one thing I really got from my Christian path and the 12 step path was the belief very very foundational belief that suffering is redemptive that there's it's never meaningless no matter how heinous and that there's uh something on that it's that it's on the other side that you have to pursue it which is really hard to do when you're in pain, you know? So it's, it may be the biggest challenge there is for anybody to go to their deepest pain in, in, in the, in faith that it's going to produce fruit, you know, produce more good than the, than the pain was bad. Um, what a challenge. And I don't blame anyone who doesn't want to do it. And that kind of directed me towards the field that I'm in now of counseling. Um, I remember being in high school and watching a, a, a TV special on heroin addiction and being blown away by it. And, and here were these heroin addicts and just how bad it was for them. And then there were these counselors that would come in and help them. And I remember watching this with my mother and I remember saying to her, uh, mom, I, I, I want to be, I want to do what those counselors do. And she said, um, well, don't you have to have been a heroin addict to do that? <laughs> you know, which seemed to be the case then, but I, I now know that not the case. But I didn't, I was like, oh, maybe you do, okay. But I filed it in there, but I didn't really act on it. So I'd had all these things happening through the 80s then, you know, the things I'm describing. And um, I had a friend who went to, who, who took a, a philosophy course at Boston College. And I was visiting his place once in Boston and he had a book on the table that was Mortimer Adler, How to Read a Book, very famous, most famous of his books. He was, a, you know, he was known as America's philosopher in the 30s and 40s, you know, especially. He, that was sort of his heyday, even though he lived much longer. Um, and I said, what's that? And he goes, oh, yeah, it's good. You should take it. I'm done with it. And so I took it and... Uh, loved it man like this how to how to think basically which is i really needed education in that how to how to um, govern your thoughts how to order your desires how to treat information on the printed page on a screen um in a logical fashion how to understand what principles you're operating from um and I had some of that just sort of randomly had figured out in life to do to a certain degree, but really needed more. And this was like perfect timing. And I, and I learned about St. John's college through that. And I eventually visited St. John's college and loved it. So I'm coming here, worked for another year in Boston and then came down and had um, another kind of flowering of myself there um, to my great benefit. And um, that takes, I don't mean to, go too long on this but the early 90s that was when that happened i graduated from st john's in 91 my original plan was to do this and then go to the next place because i was kind of you know ready to be a wanderer if i needed to be and um met someone fell in love got married so i stayed there it was not a happy union i'm sorry to say um very good woman but it just wasn't going to be so we were married for about four years uh, it was very painful to break that up. Um, but by then, 
I was established in um, Annapolis, where St. John's is located in Annapolis, Maryland, um, in a number of ways that were meaningful to me. I had a in the St. John's community, I was still involved there. And I was, I had my professional life. Uh, I had gotten a job as a counselor and was taking courses to get the license that I needed. Um, and um, I had a church community. And it seemed like for the first time, I felt like I have something to contribute to this community. You know, these little sub communities, part of a larger community, small enough of a, of a town, Annapolis, where I, I don't know if that's thinking too highly of myself, but I, I thought at least within these little spheres, I had something positive to do you know, that mattered. Um, yeah. When I went to St. John's, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, except I wasn't going to do the former thing that I knew. And I think I might have told you this story before and this is the last cuckoo story i'll tell you even though there's more to say more experiences came to me down the line but um i was um, still just gotten to st john's i was a student now in the graduate institute there um i had made some friends we had a workout partner and we'd go to the st john's gym every morning one summer to work out and um, in those days, uh, you know, we get there to crack of dawn and, you know, didn't have electronic, you know, if you had a key, you could get in and we had keys. So we'd go work out when it was, you know, the sun was just barely coming up. So there was always me and this guy and these two other guys were always there. So four of us, right? So we were um, in the habit that like, all summer we're doing this. It was a lot of camaraderie. It was awesome, really. You know, if you, if you need an environment for, getting fit and doing hard things to have these guys around was really a, a good thing. And so we were doing this together. So on, on this particular day, um, there was a fifth guy there, some just randomly. So there was five of us in that little room. The sun was up. I was on a mat and I was just stretching. And there was a lot of banter, people who was making fun of whoever put the music on, you know, well, you, we, we listen to that for um, that kind of stuff. And it was all good natured, good stuff. And, um, but I'm in my own mind. I'm in my, uh, I'm not part of the conversation again. And I'm thinking, uh, we've been reading Plato and I'm thinking about the soul and the existence of souls. And if souls exist, how significant that is a thing and how we act as if that's not the case. And I was thinking, here we are. And I'm looking at these other four guys. I'm like, we're in this room working on our bodies. And if, but if a bomb hit us and we all were vaporized instantly, there'd still be five souls. And what would they do then? And, and so I was, and, I, and it didn't get any more complicated than that. I'm stretching and I'm sitting on stretching. And I'm like, there are five souls in this room, five souls in this room. And just letting that thought sit with me felt so important. Like there's five souls in this room it's remarkable, you know, and these bodies are going to go, but the souls won't, you know, they'll go somewhere. Maybe there's a lot of unanswered questions about that. But anyway, as I'm doing this, I look, and this is where I'm, I imagine some of your listeners think I'm just like having a psychotic break or hallucinating, but believe me, there's no, I am not a substance user and have not been for a long time. And so this is, with this is happening, there's some glitch in my brain, if you want to think that, but it, the fruit of these moments are so permanent and unmistakably good that I, after thinking about these experiences a lot, I tend to accept them as divinely uh, given. Anyway, I'm sitting there, the two guys on the other side of the room, you know, they're laughing and saying things in our direction. Uh, I, I see they kind of gray out a little bit and something in their chest. Do you remember us ever talking about this? Um, something emerges. It's sort of like when you click on a computer and everything goes gray except for the thing you clicked on. Bold. Something in the middle of their chests. And I, I'm i not imagining that. I, or I'm not creating an image, an image, you know. 
um, and I'm just looking at this frozen now and they're continuing to interact. And then I turned to the guy who I work out with was standing pretty close to me. He had it right there, you know, and I can't even tell you what it looked like. I can, I can have a sense of that experience very strongly without being able to describe this at all visually, but except that it was there and I'm, I'm frozen, very frightened. And then I looked to the guy, the fifth guy, he wasn't usually there, but was that day. He's stretching on the mat right next to me, much closer. And I see right in front of my face his, and I could see that it was full of pain, hmm. pain, um, real torment. And he was happened to be laughing in that moment at what was ever going being said. And I was beside myself. I was like in a, in a stunned state. I stood up. And I felt drunk. I felt intoxicated. I was like, God, phew. And I, I got out of there and I sat on the bench in the basketball court. And I just sat there, not even speaking to myself, just like trying to absorb this. And then I, I was still frightened. I went into the men's locker room and I sat there for maybe 15 minutes, not wanting that to be there. I didn't want to see that. You know, and I'm like, should I go back? You know, uh, I wanted to flee. And so I decided I had to go back and I walk out there. The door to the weight room was, was closed, but not all the way. It was open a crack. I get close to, I could hear their voices. Same thing, laughing, whatever. I touch the door like this doo, 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 and the door opens. And I just poke my head in to look around. Everything's normal. I walk through, and as I walk over the threshold of the doorway, I'm hit by this wave of, I don't know what else to call it, but love. I felt, I love these guys. I love them so much. I would die for these guys. That was the feeling. Like it was all like a, like a mother and child, kind of overwhelming. If there was a physiological way to describe it, I'd say the oxytocin was flying inside of me, you know? I was just like, uh, it was lovely and beautiful. And I, and I, my, my feeling was, I want to feel like this all the time. Why can't I feel like this all the time? I don't feel like that all the time. In fact, I've never had that happen again like that. And that was... 30 years ago, 30 freaking years ago. And yet it still affected, it changed my life and, and sent me in the direction of wanting to do this kind of thing for a living. Um, where you're, someone walks in the room, I try, I don't always succeed, but I try to remind myself, this is a soul in here, you know? And their clothing, their body, even their personality, clothing are, 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 are exterior to that. And you might not even like somebody somebody's personality, but you can love them because of their soul. And it seemed to me, and it, it this wasn't a chosen belief so much as it was like being branded inside when this happened, that if you could if you could catch a glimpse of someone's soul, you couldn't couldn't not love them if you tried. That was the the overwhelming uh, outcome of that for me. And I try to keep that in the foremost. And when I'm dealing with people, I fail miserably. I get mad at other drivers. If someone's rude to me in Trader Joe's, you know, I, get, I get huffy. You know, it's so ridiculous. Like, come on, man. Like, you know better. <laughs> um, and yet that the battle is real, right? Um, there's something in my humanity that still wants to jump up and be all about me, you know? However... I don't beat myself up over that. He just start again, you know. So that was a another big turning point from which I never went back, you know. And I thought I just have to be about dealing with this part of the people's being. However I can do it, however badly I do it, even if I fail. Like what else is there? I don't want to sell widgets. You know, and I don't need to make fun of people who are salesmen and um, 
it's kind of hard not to sound like I'm doing that, but I just I could not do any other crazy thing to make a living, you know. Um, and I didn't know how to make a living at this, but I convinced someone to give me a job in a clinic where they needed an addiction counselor for which I had very little training. And, and the reason I got the job I found out was because nobody else wanted this job. It was like a bad area of housing project near Baltimore. It was you know, really dangerous, gunshots every night. You know, it was like, and there was a guy that worked in there, the, the director who was a great guy who knew a lot about what I needed to know about. And he'd said, he sat me down, he goes, look, Jerry, you, you know a lot about recovery because I'd gone to so many recovery meetings, hundreds by then, but you don't know much about addiction. You, you, if you want to work in this field, you have to make it your job, your calling to learn everything you can about addiction as a disease process and what it does to body, soul, and spirit, you know? And I was like, yeah, I'm in, man, I'm in. And that became my entryway into the mental health world. And I did that and did the required coursework, took the tests with the state and all that stuff. And so got a license that was really great. I could go out on my own, do this if I wanted to. Um, and so uh, so I did, you know, and so I've been doing that uh, up until the time I went to St. John's to work at St. John's again. This was in 2009 when you showed up. Um, I had been doing all addiction stuff. And that's when I made a turn from to the just the straight up mental health world and not just addiction counseling. Um, and big difference, actually, as it turns out. And I had a lot to learn still um, and hopefully have been learning ever since. But uh, um, delightful field to be in, exhausting field to be in. And I, and I find that... Uh, and I'm always on the edge of a kind of unproductive exhaustion. I have to be really extremely diligent to figure out what what is the contribution I can I can make and go no further, or else you're not making any contribution. You know, that's a real tough one, I think, to figure out because you just want to help as much as you can. And you want to then and when I do that and I get exhausted, I have to take a break because I burn out then. And that's not the way to go. So in 2007, I was burnt out from addiction, being in the addiction world and doing that and having good fruit from it. Good stuff happens. People get helped. People are grateful. You know, I am still here from some of those old patients, you know, in clinics I worked in. Um, very happy to know that they were right. Um, some people died. You know, not everyone makes it. Um, but in 2007, I was just, really in 2005, I was whipped. And it took me two years to get it together to say, I'm gonna take a sabbatical year. Ended up going to India. I saw, had a little condo, sold it, had a chunk of money that I'd never had before. Right before the real estate tanked, I guess I got lucky. Um, and went to India and lived there for a year. And as far as I was concerned, I had enough money I could live for 10 years if I wanted to. So I wasn't sure how long I was gonna be there. But did for one year, and then I was as soon as I started thinking about life back in the states, it made me want to go back where I could get a good Oreo cookies, <laughs> <laughs> not these fake ones that they have there. No, that's that's an exaggeration. But um, it was a fantastic experience to be there, and you've you visited there. You know what I'm talking about? Complete otherworldly wacko. Not a day is not some extraordinary w weird thing happening that you just either you cry or you laugh, you know. Um, but anyway, so this this path has still been the path. I've the one that was initiated by that t-shirt selling experience, and this strange guy in New York City who brought me even closer to what what was supposed to happen for me. Um, I don't know if he was a real man or an angel or something, you know. <laughs> Really, we were probably talking for 60 seconds. There he is, there he's gone. And I'm like, what? But that those things, they were they were real trajectory changes. And then and then big ones happen. I don't know why they happen when they happen. Ten every 10 years or so, something remarkable seems to happen that 
And then there's long gaps of silence in between that I don't understand either. For example, when I got married in the early 90s, this is now just two years after that experience in the weight room. I wasn't sure whether we should get married or not. We loved each other. I was very nervous about getting married. Uh, getting married in general and getting married to her in particular. We, weren't, we were both weren't sure, but we were going through with it, right? And um, I prayed, 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 prayed um, for guidance. Seemingly heard nothing. I didn't, or if, it, or, if, or if there was an answer, I could not re receive it. And we got married, very painful experience, and it's over. And um, and then uh, what for? And again, I was confronted with the, first of all, I just had to stand on faith that these other manifestations in my life were real and not me making something up. I knew that was the case, that, that we were, they were real because I, I didn't have the imaginative power to make up those things. I didn't have any of the raw materials that would have come up with it, you know? Oh, you can have this uplifting experience. No, I had no idea what that meant, you know? These things were completely novel and very much personal and being oriented. There was a being with me, you know? So I was not gonna give up on that ever. But I don't, I don't, I still don't understand why God is silent when He's silent, and um, and when He speaks, and why why He does when He does, and when He doesn't when He doesn't, and maybe He's speaking, and I just don't know it. But I'm staying on that path, very very firmly, um, and trusting that all suffering is redeemable. And then it's never for nothing. When that marriage was over, um, and I was just now living in an apartment by myself, and I'm pondering what, what just happened over the last three or four years. Uh, the idea that all the perceptions of my own sacrifices and effort and energy and completely given over to try to make this work were for nothing, was what made it the most painful. It wasn't so much that we were gonna be grieving each other because we didn't get along well. We really wouldn't have wanted that for the rest of our lives. But the fact that whatever we suffered was for nothing was too, was too un intolerable an idea, you know, or reality. It would, if I thought that, I would just have so much despair that I couldn't hardly breathe. You know, my chest would hurt. And it was just a, it was a crisis that I had to work through. I wouldn't call it a crisis of faith. Probably it was a crisis of applying my faith that I had to figure out how to do, how to really believe that this was not for nothing, you know, when it seemed futile. Uh, so it was, and then that's, you know, again, less than 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, all of that was happening much better and I've learned an enormous amount from that experience and feel very, very confident uh, in saying that none of that was for waste, was wasted, you know, for her either. Um, yeah, that brings us, you know, I still take the occasional sabbatical year when I can get my hands on some money. I got married two years ago, which I never thought was going to happen again. Um, and, you know, met this woman who was just, beyond delightful you know we and we were just about to sell well we just celebrated our two-year anniversary and we've had two really blissed out years it's like i don't know if it's because we're both older like and, and there was a lot, lot less mystery about what this takes you know to live with someone like this but uh it's been very easy and i think i tend to think it's because she's made it very easy she's so easy to be with and she asked me to ask you a question she said, uh, ask him if I'm the oldest geezer he's ever had on a show. Uh, uh, I don't think so. I think there's been okay. older folks. So Excellent. you're still a young man, Jerry. Young at heart. Thanks. Oh man, I can't wait to tell her that. We have a lot on of record. jokes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> she said when she's so freaking funny, Tash, and she's just the, her her ability to come up with a quip 
is and then you know you, you laugh it's just like a moment of freedom you know like you're it's so and so great to share humor like that so we're, we're sitting at our dining room table once both of us reading we spent a lot of time both of our heads down reading whatever we're reading and then just sharing little bits and comments and stuff and so she looks up and she goes uh you're sexy and i said <laughs> i said well for a geezer and she goes well yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She gave me a compliment once, and uh, I said, uh, I don't think I'm that good, you know? And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you're definitely an A minus. <laughs> we we laugh. I don't, if we have problems, I don't know what they are, because we're laughing too much to figure them out, you know? <laughs> sure, there are things. that has got to be, but uh, maybe it takes being married five years to start seeing those things, you know? Mm. So, so far, so very, very good. Yeah. She, uh, I could just quip after quip. She's just so hilarious. Um, what's another one? I don't know. She, we went to this. Have you ever been in DC and go to that place, uh, Sweet Greens? It's like a oh, sure. chain store for salads. Really good stuff, right? So, salads right she loves sweet greens she says i gotta take you to sweet greens so we go to sweet greens and we're both like our head over our bowls and we're eating and um i'm like this is really really good man this is like this is so substantial and she's not looking up without missing beat she goes i don't do girly salads bitch <laughs> <laughs> and i don't know why that endears me her to me enormously you know mm -hmm. um very kind human being i don't know again these good things that have come to me tashin over the course of my entire life but especially my adult life i don't understand i constantly ask why me like in, in the good sense like why do i get this how did she show up you know like i was set i was single for life you know i was by the time i hit my 50s I was divorced at 38 and by the time and 40s was not comfortable being single but 50s I was like that's it man that's I'm okay with this you know this is the way it is um I'd like women I would I would like it but I'm not looking for it and I now feel kind of good going to bed alone you know I didn't like that for a long time and uh and then she shows up and we you know we knew each other for a whole year before we, it became romantic. Um, and even then we were like, should we, should we, should we, I don't know. You know, <laughs> we had two lengthy dates, like three or four hour conversations at a restaurant. We were trying to decide of the wisdom of that at our age <laughs> and what it means and what do we want for the rest of our lives and stuff like that, which I had put that out of my head as, um, you know, stuff not to worry about anyway so that's a delightful good that's happened um we share a lot in the spiritual realm not everything um but we challenge each other in good ways you know i don't know if this is too much information but um i think it's a very rare thing when someone opens their eyes and they wake up in the morning and they're happy Mm. and mm. that's her when she she opens her eyes and she sees me she smiles and she's happy mm. like, that is just a minor miracle you know i don't know that human beings have that happen too often you know people are grumpy in the morning or you know not focused on anything but some other staying in bed or whatever you know she's immediately uh in good in good spirits good cheer uh so there's lots of stuff I could say more about, but anyway, let's that's probably enough. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing so fully. It was a delight to hear that. And uh yeah, uh a real treasure to receive. So thank you. Well, I, I appreciate your your patience too. And I know that a lot of the stuff you'd heard before in our friendship as it you know progressed, but um um I'm happy to 
I'm happy and also nervous to share some of these things because I realize how they sound mm-hmm. kind of otherworldly and um and having been in the mental health world, I do I've had plenty of patients who were delusional, you mm-hmm. know, that uh can seem extremely normal in ninety-eight percent of the time, but there's that two percent that's really off the rails. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh so I know that exists. I don't, I'm not that, mm. <laughs> I'm quite certain, very stable. I don't have, um, I don't suffer a lot of anxiety. Mm. Um, some, not no, not none, but uh, not like in the old days, you know, growing up and, and feeling like to figure yourself out in this world is a threat of some sort, you know? Mm-hmm. Maybe age helps you with that too. I w- wouldn't like s- s- totally spiritualize it. You get older, you just decide where how to where to place your attention and your energies. Hmm. I like being older. You Most talk, of the time. You talked about um having a that like a theme in your life was being more idealistic than cynical. And I wondered what was something that you were idealistic about in your youth. Um What was that like for you then? I think um, it's similar to the, uh, uh, the something you'll be familiar with when Achilles, half man, half God, given the choice of the long, peaceful life versus the short, glorious life. And the first time I heard that, I might, might have been in high school, and it really resonated because I was I would be like, short, glorious life, even though I didn't know what glory meant. Um, to me, the way I internalized that was to live uh, uh, for a mission in life rather than the long, peaceful life. To me, represented the domestic life where you, you know, you raise a family, you have a house, you protect it. So like Odysseus being a farmer rather than a warrior, you know, mm-hmm. I want to identify with the warrior side, not the necessarily the fight, but that a mission oriented way of being. Um, and I think it could be really like the Vietnam War. Um, I wasn't on the, to be a warrior for me during that era would be to be against the war. Um, that, you don't. I don't want to kill people. And, and, but you have to be paradoxically, militantly, stridently about that in a world where there's always wars. And that our own country, you know, bombs the shit out of people every day. Um, so like that kind of idealism and and which meant to me not not the mission of making a million dollars. Not that I, I wouldn't couldn't be as greedy as the next man. I don't mean to suggest I was like saintly in that respect. It was just as much vanity probably either way for me um, that I wanted to do something that mattered. And I remember having so much anxiety about that as a kid and in high school and in college, um, not knowing a direction and not feeling at ease with it, not knowing. Um, I'd lose sleep. I remember there were a couple of nights where I did not sleep at all. And that's like serious anxiety. Um, And not knowing how to remedy that. Uh, And having no real assurance that that won't always be the way I felt. You know, like I'll be this person who doesn't figure himself out you know um Mm. yeah so it had to do with it it, it, i don't claim it as a virtue feeling that way it was like you could be very idealistic or very cynical and be just as vain about it Mm. you know and i think that was the big shift for me was seeing that ultimately i was it was all very self-serving anyway you know and that there was a different thing to stand on came into my life, you know? Um, And if you, you know, I talked about shrewdness being like a defining value. I couldn't have told you that at the time. I I would have denied that. And uh, I didn't understand it. I don't understand myself. Mm -hmm. And it's only in retrospect to look back, I'm like, yeah, the only thing that explains all of my decisions is that, you know, that I was trying to, to be clever and, a step ahead of everyone else and being 
you know, kind of a magician. You talked about um, viewing in shadows and the sort of shadow of relationship to your father and the men of his generation. How did how did that show up in your life? What was that like for you? It, it showed up in a kind of um, well despair a little bit initially, and then kind of a haughty, um, you know, contempt for the older generation. You know, uh, and I'm not alone in that. I know, and there's stuff out there to read. Like I was reading a an essay by Walter Benjamin um, Benjamin uh, called Experience, where he just drags through the mud what people think of as as experience as a valuable thing. You know, when in reality it, it it's more like it just locks people into formulaic ways of thinking. Oh, I had this experience, therefore that's the way it is, you know? And I could see the danger of that. Um, but I was gravitating towards um, reading things that tried to explain, you know, why this generation ahead of me sucked. <laughs> you know, and, and you can't, you didn't have to look much further than Vietnam War really, because soldiers being lied to, uh, you know, reasons, the glorious reasons that were stated for war versus why we're really doing these things, you know? Um, yeah, so maybe I called it idealism, but maybe there was a cynicism there too, you know? Um, yeah. The way I the way I personalized that was I didn't want to be um, money hungry, mm. and and I called it idealism. Um, it was just a different kind of uh, perhaps a different kind of vain pursuit, you know. I think part of why those ecstatic experiences were so ecstatic was that there was at least temporarily of some kind of freedom from the self, you know, freedom from my own urgent desire to be justified, you know. When I first moved to Boston, Tash, and, and that same church I told you about, Park Street Church, went to that church, and they had some guy, old duffer, preacher, you know, this old congregational New England guy, you know, they had a lot of those guys. And uh, he was giving a message and I'm listening to him and, and he made this statement that I have took then to my heart and I've been thinking about it ever since. He said, great day in the life of any man is the day he stops trying to justify himself. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew that was important. You know, I was probably 34 when I heard it. Um, 32, no, wait a minute, I'm talking about 24, 24. Um, and I, and if you Google, if you Googled justify yourself, you'll get a lot of stuff that says you should be trying to justify yourself because it's the kind of stuff that's saying you should try to live a good life. You should try to be productive. You should try to make your time on earth, not a waste and, and, and being a taker, which I can, I can totally get the idea of that. That's not how he meant it, I don't think. And so f this idea that um, my suffering, my personal suffering might be meaningful and that um, there's some purpose for my life that I couldn't come up with on my own, even on the best day of my life, that I need to surrender to, requires grappling with that idea that it's not me justifying myself. That there's some other thing out there that's higher than me that uh, has a, the ultimate say in what that means for me. Um, and it's it's difficult to do that because, you know, a very common way of thinking in our culture, whether you call, anyone calls themselves spiritual or religious or not, is if you have enough time, talent, and money, you can get make you can provide for all your needs in life and be happy, you know? Um, and it's really hard not to think that. 
um, but it's so kind of also easily disproven. There's no, there's no shortage of rich, talented people who want to cut their throats, hmm. you know. How did that um, shadow show up in your relationship with your father? Um, I, if you, if you take the four uh, Jungian archetypes of masculine energy, king, warrior, magician, lover, for me, it, it took the form of rejection of the king. Um, and so in that way of thinking, there's like kind of a pyramid and there's healthy king energy. And then there's two opposite poles of unhealthy king energy, being a tyrant or being a coward, you know. Mm. And um, and so here was this guy, my dad, who was sort of a tyrant. And I didn't understand the complexities of that kind of energy. Why, why when it could be healthy to be the leader, being decisive, um, doing it for the common good, not your own thing. You know, that, that, that kind of stuff. I, I didn't have any idea about that. So I just sort of in a wholesale way rejected King energy. I didn't like being in charge of anybody else. And, you know, doing this counseling thing that I'm doing solo, I'm in, in an office here. I rent this office. There are two empty offices. I could potentially, I suppose, work this out with the landlord. He doesn't, he's, he's retired, retired lawyer. I'm always here by myself. I could probably rent out one or two of those other offices to someone, make a, a little partnership and um, take, you know, 25, 35, 45, 50% of their intake and they don't pay anything else but that and they had this office like there's ways to do that people do that all the time but uh, but whenever anyone suggested that i was like no i don't want to be anyone's boss hmm. the hell with that you know and i realized there was a there was an okay part to that and there was a part of that that was just sort of rejecting possible uh demand on me to be kingly in a good way hmm. i'll give you an example of that too I was in a Starbucks when I was first reading up on this, these Jungian masculine archetypes. By the way, I have a book over here. This is really worth reading if you ever get around to it. Have you ever seen that? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I haven't read it yet, though. Oh, man. You can listen to it on YouTube, too. They, they mm. have it. Um, uh, I was, this is early 2000s. I was really wrestling with this. And um, I was sitting in a Starbucks and uh, it was Christmas time, and there were these two guys talking in the middle of the, of the seated area really loudly. So you, everyone in the whole place could hear what they were saying, or you could hear what one of the two guys was saying. The other guy was more soft spoken, which is rude, but it's, you know, what the hell? You're in a public place. That's what happens. You can't get too upset. Um, but he was talking from what they were saying. I could tell that they ran a sober house. And they were talking about the clients in the sober house. So these are people like right out of rehab who need a place to live. And they're trying to get organized their life as a sober person. They're really useful places, right? So I could see that the, the guy was talking too loud. He looked like a biker dude. He was scary. Um, he was the manager. And I could tell the other guy was probably the owner, right? And he's giving him a report. of, And he's saying, well, you know, Joe Schmo hasn't paid his rent for this month. And he says it's because his dad is sick. And I don't believe him. And you know, he's saying all the stuff that was like super confidential, including everyone's full name. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is terrible, you know? And I'm, and I'm the part of the unkingly part of me was wanting to get the hell out of there. But I'm like, do I need to? And I'm, but I'm like reading this book and I'm like, like, what is healthy king energy for me? As I thought, I think I need to go talk to these guys. Huh. I didn't want to, <laughs> believe uh -huh. me so i go up i go up and i like kneel at the table and i say to both of the guys look i can tell by your conversation that we're kind of in the same business you work with people in recovery right from addiction you go they go yeah 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 i said well the volume with which you're using to describe people and using their full name it's not ethical to do that you should not be using people's full name even at a normal tone you should not be doing that right and so i'm saying this trying to i knew it was confrontational but i was hoping they could take it in a good spirit well the biker dude louder than he was saying before he goes well fuck you like that 
He goes, you want to take this outside? You want to go? We'll, we'll take this outside right now. You know? Fashion. The whole coffee shop stopped. <laughs> like, the, the workers were frozen looking at us like this, you know? Everybody was looking. If there was music playing, I couldn't hear it, you know? Like, it was just like, bang! And I'm like, I'm st I stand up, I'm like, oh. I thought, this is not what I wanted to have happen, you know? And I'm having this confrontation with this guy. We're back and forth. And I'm just saying, look, it's ridiculous. We're not going to fight. It's just ridiculous to say that. Oh, yeah? You want to do your job? And he's not standing up, which I knew. You know, so you know how you have like a thousand thoughts in a nanosecond when this stuff could happen? Like, I'm thinking, okay, if he stands up, is unavoidable. We're going to be, there's going to be a violence. I got to get him outside. I got to make sure he throws the first punch. So he goes to jail. And I don't, I got to make sure a lot of people are watching this so they can say what happened. You know, mm -hmm. um, I'm like, da, 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 like, you know, and he doesn't stand up. And finally it calms down. It ends. And I go back to my table. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, there's nothing more that can be said. It's not going to be, there's not going to be any violence. I'm sure everyone's relieved. I'm just going to go now. So I got together and I left and I go to sit in my car and I'm telling you, my hands are shaking. I'm like, da, 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 da. and I'm like, oh. you know, I told the guy, I'm not afraid of you. This is partly, hopefully that it would back him down a little bit. And I think it did because he didn't get up, but that would have been the moment, you know, either you're going to get up or you're not. He didn't. Um, I was like, is that, and I, and, I, and I had to wrestle with that for a long time. I talked to several friends about it. Like, did I do, was I doing something in a healthy, kingly way there? Hmm. Um, was I just being control freak? You know, like, I don't think so. I think I did the right thing, but boy, was it not easy. And, and I, if I ever was feeling my shadow, it was then, like, as someone who comes in, like the old man, and say, do it this way, hmm. you know? Um, and I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be a tyrant and I didn't want to be a coward, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that seemed to be the path anyway. So that was, that was one way I would wrestle with it. Um, mm -hmm. the other, another one for like the warrior. And, and if you get deeper into that book, you'll see what he described those guys, two, two authors, they describe there's boy psychology and man psychology and boy psychology has, has a, a similar, pyramid structure for each of those archetypes only a boy version of it and there's there's again there's a healthy boy psychology and two opposite poles of unhealthy but for the boy psychology at its pinnacle of, of good boy psychology healthy which helps you launch into the man version it's still um limited because it's very ego driven hmm. so like say the warrior for the boy the highest expression of warrior energy for the boy would be to be a hero Hmm. to want to be heroic still about you yet it's much more noble than wanting to be you know manipulative and uh or just getting what you want and being a bully or you know whatever the other unhealthy parts were right so for the defining characteristic of manly good masculine energy for men by this using this model is uh uh humility it's being done for the common good always like the the warrior does not want to fight but will fight if if he has to for the common good and he'll back down if he has to for the common good too no ego and he, they tell a story i think it was in there maybe it was some other thing i read where there was this uh, um samurai you know the samurai had a master to whom he's devoted that his this particular samurai's master got um assassinated so it's up to the samurai to avenge his master samurai tracks down the the assassin and he has him he draws his sword and he's gonna complete the um avenging and the and the assassin spits in his face and he puts his sword back and goes away hmm. and, and he doesn't kill him presumably for another day he will but because when the assassin did that, and if he would have followed through with it, he would have been killing, oops, I lost you. Mm. You're back. Um, he would have been killing him for his own reasons. 
because he was affronted when he was spit in his, his face was spit in. Um, and not that we're going to be doing this on some level of assassins and avenging and everything, just as an as an object lesson to see that healthy masculine, healthy warrior is not doing it for himself, hmm. you know? And, that, and if you take hero energy into man psychology, it's gonna be problematic, you know? Um, so I'm fascinated by that stuff. And I think for most of my adult life, when I thought of being a warrior of some sort, which could come out in sports maybe, I would think heroically, I wanna take the last shot. I wanna be the guy who carries the team, you know? or whatever and it's useful because it happens sometimes you know but the bigger game the bigger end game that we're interested in is uh is to be a certain kind of person mm. you know? and and to act in ways in line with having a noble soul and that means doing battle with yourself in a certain way, which I know you you probably understand very well. Um, yeah, so that whole shadow, so shadow work to me, if I, I like Jung a lot, you know, um, I don't think you have to be on, totally on board with him to find him enormously helpful, you know, but uh, looking at it this way with those four archetypes, and there are other ways to look at manly archetypes. There's lots of other schemas out there, but um this one is simple it, it explains a lot to me about my experience and it helps me i can see where i was you know in the shadowy both still as a boy you know like i wanted to be the hero as a grown man is not the best use hmm. warrior energy it's not it's gonna it's gonna cause more disharmony than harmony and it won't be for the common good um, and so putting that framework, it made it easier, easier for me to evaluate past behavior, future behavior, that moment in the Starbucks, like, fuck, I got to do this. You know, mm. like, <laughs> um, I had a second incident very similar to that, uh, in that same year, I went to visit my parents and my mother on Long Island and my mother's like, Hey, could you go? go to that Walmart over in, you know, such and such green acres and uh, buy this. I get, it's the last thing I need to get for someone's Christmas present. I'm like, yeah, I go Walmart at Christmas time. Absolute madhouse, man. I had to park like a mile away from the place in this huge mall outdoor, this mall. So I get in there, I find the thing. They have like 15 checkout lines, all with like 30 people long, you know, insane. But there I am doing it for mom. I got this big things box, sit, waiting, 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 get closer and closer and closer. I'm now the next person. These two guys come out of nowhere and just cut the line. Hmm. Now, not that this should be a big deal, but this was in an, I was like the only white guy in the, in the store. And these, and, and it scared me a little, maybe it shouldn't to be like the minority because you know how it is being a white guy you're usually in the majority all the time so i noticed this and maybe that's an indication of some aspect of racism i need to get over but anyway i was a little more edgy for that i the people that were in the aisle next to me look at me like these fools are have lack don't have any manners but they're not saying anything and then i look behind me and i see this line of 30 people all looking at me like little puppies like they're upset by this but they're not going to say anything because these guys look tough and scary right and i'm like oh, gotta be a king do i not again <laughs> not again so i said to these guys uh excuse me sir um the line's back here well fuck you motherfucker i'm gonna you know i'm not waiting on that line and he takes this cash and he just throws it down on the thing you know, and I said to the, the ca cashier, like, look, you don't have to serve him. Uh, if you need help, get your manager, you know, and she was terrified. She says, no, I just want to get him out of there. Right. And as I'm looking at these guys, I could see the one guy was the real guy doing this. And the other guy was embarrassed that he didn't want to be. Right. Um, 
And so he's staring me down, like with the hairy eyeball, the guy, the, the bad guy. He's like, and we're just look, we're having a standoff, no words, right? And I and I'm thinking, okay, I said what needed to be said to everyone it needed to be said to. Uh, do I need to go into warrior mode? Do mm -hmm. I just like yank physic? I could have physically. I was a little bigger than the guy. Did not want to. Do I? Do I? Do I do anything else? I thought no, I don't do anything else. Um, but my my own selfishness jumped up a little bit because as he's staring at me, I said, Is there "Something else you want to say to me?" Mm. And he put his head down, and that was it. Mm. You know? And they walked out. So I then paid my thing. And I think everyone around was relieved that they were gone, just gone. Mm -hmm. And I'm leaving the Walmart. I'm like, I hope I don't get shot. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> I kind of hope they're not waiting for me out here, you know, mm -hmm. with a gun or something. And it wasn't. And I got, I got in my car and got out of there. And again, though, I was really not as shaking as I was the first time. But, um, and thankfully, that kind of thing hasn't happened since. That was a long time ago. Mm. Um, 20 years ago mm. but i that is the that is where the where the battle has taken place for me and i and that's why i really appreciate these guys the way they mm -hmm. get together you know mm -hmm. um and, and again there's a lot of ways to do it like you think of inner child work you know um it's a really valid approach like this we be, we made choices about what we believed when we were five about what this meant that this this wounded thing that's happening to me um and then we go with that for the rest of our lives that interpretation and it's in your body as well as in your intellect you know what do you do about that hmm. um, that's really there's got to be a lot of different ways but i think in the end it's there's no way around getting in touch with the painful part you got to be in it and then rewire it somehow Changing gears slightly, um, yeah. can you speak to the distinction between therapy and counseling and uh, what your work has been with counseling? Sure. Fairly simple. I, if, if you look me up on psychology today, find a therapist, I'm in there, like everybody mm -hmm. does this. Um, and, and so the word therapist, though, to me is um, someone who is their approach is much more process oriented. Like it almost doesn't matter what you're talking about. Your, your goal is to um, clarify how we think about things and how do you distill the important aspects of this, whatever the issue is, you know, therapy. Um, for me, a counselor is someone who's, uh, you might say it's a little bit more having to do with the content and um, not, not thinking about the process ever, but um much more willing to offer counsel, you know, and say, oh, this is what I think, you know, mm -hmm. where a, a more traditional therapist might never do that, might never do that. I think most of the people out there doing this work do a little both, you know, and hopefully that's an area of growth for me. They need to be able to be more process oriented sometimes, you know. Um, there's a great organization called the American Academy of Psychotherapists that's all about the process, a process oriented approach. And I went to one of their conferences a couple of years back and it was unbelievable, eye-opening. You get assigned this group and they're all therapists, all counselors, therapists. And you meet twice a day with this group for the for every day of the conference. It was like four or five days. And you really get to know these people and it's all about the process. Mm -hmm. Like you could bring up anything you want, say about any topic, anything, doesn't matter. You just, and then you'll get, you, everyone talking to you about how you process this, how you do that. And it, 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 it got a little like funny for me, like uh, um, people would say things like, I don't think someone would say something, someone would, would give them feedback. And the first person would say, you're not meeting me. Mm. You're not me, you know, and I can get it. At the same time, I got sick of it after about three days. <laughs> like, okay. Come on, I know you. No one's meeting you, all right. Let's just settle. Let's just. Like, <laughs> I, I got a little impatient, but when I got out of that, I had felt a, a shift in perspective that was really useful, really helpful, 
And so I think that's part of the therapist counselor thing in my mind. You, you'll ask that question to a lot of other people in the mental health world and they'll say, nah, no distinction, you know? Um, and uh, the difference between addiction counseling, they don't say addiction, well, someone might say addiction therapist, but addiction counseling versus a mental health approach, the mental health model is saying, oh, there are all these pre-existing earlier experiences that are producing this other kinds of fruit, bad fruit in your life that we're trying to make those connections from the past to the present, where addiction counseling is much more about the nuts and bolts of the present. You need to be uh, apart from the object of your addiction. You need to be understanding what are the intermediary triggers that lead you closer to the object of your addiction and take steps to prevent them from being present in your life. It takes a lot of digging to figure out how just to stabilize the biological aspect of this where you're not being provoked to the addiction. Hmm. Body, stick to say bio, psycho, social. Then you deal with the psychological aspects that are sort of the refuse after the tsunami has been gone for a little while. You can start to see, oh, is there real depression going on here? Um, sleep issues, old trauma, things that contributed to the use but didn't form the addiction. Hmm. It's, it's hard to make those distinctions between the reasons someone started using substances and the, and the reasons that they can't stop different. If there's addiction, I, I stop, I like using the word addiction. It's done, it's fallen into disuse. The, the current term is substance use disorder, hmm. but I don't like it really. I'll use it because you have to, but uh, it doesn't make a distinct, strong enough distinction in my mind between addiction and substance abuse, which is, they don't like saying either because they think it's stigmatizing, but um, yeah. Anyway, that's getting into that field. But I think uh, when, I, when, you, when I made a, a shift from substance addiction counseling to mental health counseling, different focus, hmm. you are looking at now all these, the mental health model is all these other factors that are, have formed you and how can we reform them if they need to be, you know? Hmm. How did you approach that with people when it was mental health counseling rather than addiction counseling? Um, in the in the environments where I did addiction counseling, it was, it was much more focused on stabilizing their uh, life, day-to-day -day life, and trying to identify the destabilizing things in the here and now. Uh, so for mental health counseling, it was way, you're assuming there was some level of stability already here from which they can reliably deal with past stuff. Mm. Mm. So like say someone is an alcoholic and they go into a clinic and they stop drinking and then in this controlled environment somewhat, um, you probably can't, depending on how long they were drinking, it'd be tough to make a really reliable psychiatric diagnosis for, for another six months, you know, assuming that they're clean, not using. Um, as it takes time for the, if someone is addicted to alcohol or some other drug, they will be depressed. This is, they go together, you know? And so to, to what degree was the, what was the preexisting stuff then that you won't be able to see very clearly right away, you know, hmm. it all gets kind of muddled together. Yeah. But I was glad to, you know, it felt like I was really leaving a profession and going into another profession when I went from one to the other. And who shows up? Michael W. Fogelman, the That's bird right. man. That's right. Huh. What was that shift like for you? I had some run-ins with the school over it because I wanted to be more, um, like the addiction counselor takes urine screens hmm. and makes sure and, and gets as much um, background information before you ever see the person. Do they have any legal issues? Do they lose a job? Do they have medical issues? Do, you know, what's, what are the different things that are going wrong? Because when they start talking to you about the substance use, they're not gonna tell you the truth right away. And so the more you know about what the background is, the better you can do addiction counseling. So when I started 
say from the assistant dean would say, I'd like you to see this person. And I, I started asking questions. They wouldn't tell me anything. Hmm. And, I, and I had to go to the dean and say, like, well, aren't we going to do urine screens? Mm -hmm. How do we know this kid is, is telling the truth, you know? I, I don't know if this sounds cynical to you, Tashin, but I used to joke around. Truth has a sound, and the sound of truth is the sound of urine hitting a cup, you know? Oh. Well. <laughs> it is amazing how people will lie, and all of a sudden, and the urine screen comes back, and there it is. Yeah. Doing this and that and that and the other thing. Um, but that was, and that's part of, like, there's something a little confrontational in in addiction counseling that does not happen in the same way in mental health counseling and or therapy, you know, mm -hmm. old school, old school addiction counseling that that guy at that first clinic I worked at took, did, and he taught me and I did once in a while would be like this. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you the last time I did this and I said, I'm not doing it that way anymore. Here we are in a group, like 20 people in a group. And I got the urine screen results back. So I know Joe Schmo over there used cocaine three days ago, right? And that's his drug. And he's not admitting to it, though. If he admitted to it, all would be well. We'd work with it, right? But he's saying that he didn't use. Anyway, so we're going around the room doing a check-in thing. And, the, and they said to the guy, hey, Joe, uh, how long have you been clean now? He's like, oh, Jerry. <laughs> Since last Thanksgiving, this is probably like March now, right? Because last Thanksgiving, man, I love it. It's so awesome to be clean sober. Just like, I'm mean, yeah, tell us more. And you and you get them to go as far out on a limb as they can possibly go. It's called smash mouth counseling. Huh. And and he's like, Yeah, really? How good is it? Wow, la, 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 so great, so great. Then you go, hmm. Aaron Screen, two days ago, dirty. Cocaine. And he just and he's and it's exceedingly painful for him. And it's it's and it's not ineffective. So this guy got up and he stormed out of the room. I don't like the way you're coming at me. Blah 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 blah. He's gone. Never to come back. I have no idea whether he ever got well or not. Hmm. Um so I decided I'm not gonna do that. But it does, I mean if if addiction creates this mental fog where a person can't can have insight into themselves at all and, and in fact are lying a lot, um, that they, if they get hit hard, it has a chance to um, be their teacher. And, and maybe you could say break them a little bit to the point where they're receptive to uh, real help hmm. and, and able to admit their, I'm lying. Um, and then something good could happen. I was in a group once where the other counselor was this old street guy, very experienced. And someone was talking and this guy had a heroin addiction, but he was like supposedly clean. And he was saying how much he loved life now and he's going to do this and do that. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this guy's definitely doing better. And my partner says, hey, man, quit, quit bullshitting us. Come on, tell us the truth now. It's all bullshit what you're saying. Tell us the truth. And I'm like, what's going on here? You know? And then the guy goes, You're right, you're right. I'm lying, I'm lying. <laughs> like, holy cow. <laughs> like, how did you know that? And how did you have the wherewithal to do that? And you know, I don't know. I didn't have that kind of street smarts. <laughs> Some people do. But uh Anyway, so there's it's a different environment, different uh, I, addiction counseling really needs to be in a group setting. It's not that individual is not helpful, but it can't be the main way um, because there's shame involved. And having your shame, sort of like at the AA meeting that I started going to, um, whatever shame I was feeling was discharged somewhat whenever I'm, you're in a group with people who are all admitting to the same thing. And that group process starts to get rid of every time someone says something that you understand because you had the same experience, you've lost a little bit of your shame. You've toxic. And if that happens two or three times an hour over the course of two months, three months, the next two years of your life, you're a different person hmm. at the end of that or down the road, you know.
very interesting process. Anyway, that's what I was in. Um, there's another probably more effective strategy called motivational interviewing. Hmm. So a lot. I don't Have you ever heard of that? Um, the name is familiar, but I don't know anything about it. Yeah, I, I, we don't have to get into it. Um, it's a it's a fascinating approach. It's it's tailor made. If you're sitting there with somebody, and you know what they need to do, and they're not, and they're resistant to doing it, um, and it's a way of uh, helping reduce their um, defenses, and they're left only with their own desire to be well. Hmm. Um, it 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 sort of strips their bad motives from their good motives. It helps them fall away and all of a sudden they just oh they feel differently about what they want hmm. it's genius hmm. some other time maybe if you want we can just talk you know hmm. offline but um it's a little bit maybe more lengthy than we need i want to ask i i remember um so just to give a little bit of context for this question and you may not be able to answer this but i remember well, so just, yeah, even to go even a degree back in high school, and, you know, I would have told you this, I'm sure, but in high school, I did, there was a period, I don't even know how long it was, but there was a period of like, maybe two years where I just did as much, as much drugs as I could get my hands on, you know, it's like smoking pot, shrooms, acid, mostly, I did a little bit of ecstasy at the time, but, you know, it was, it was all like, it, you know, it was nothing like cocaine or heroin or something, but um, it was like, did all the things that I could at the time and um you know searching for transformation yeah yeah I wasn't and in fact I wouldn't I would that was that was formative for me you know I think it was I think it was actually like I looking back on it now I see how that led me where I was and don't you know uh that's just how it went down but anyway I remember freshman year of college I I think we, there was a mandatory talk that I had to go to and it was it was with you and I think maybe the other counselors also had something but I got you or something oh orientation okay. orientation yep yeah yeah and I was like you know and I came in and I was like oh like this you know this guy's gonna tell us because I'd been to dare in middle school which was like mm -hmm. in retrospect it was just like oh let's lie they, they were like oh you know if you smoke any weed it's gonna kill you kind of thing like very mm -hmm. hyperbolic um right right and um, black and white thinking and uh, I was like oh you know this guy is going to come and tell us a bunch of crap about how drugs are bad like I know drugs are good it's fine uh and uh I remember it was just astonishing to me I was very impressed by you and what you said and and then that led to like major life choices you know I was transitioning anyway so I wasn't in the kind of context with my friends and stuff but you know I think I smoked weed like once or twice my freshman year at the beginning I was like I'm I'm done with this stuff I you know I just was kind of like no I, I think yeah, I did acid that semester like it over winter break but basically basically like I led to putting that stuff away for a long time and um you know and then later I've been more recently that's a whole other story but um mm -hmm. but uh I'm curious I, I I can't remember for me the life of me what you would have said in that talk that would have changed my mind so much, you know, uh, I went from, oh, you know, like it was just, it was just total 180. And I remember, I'm, I'm curious if you remember anything that you might've said in that I talk. I the notes for that. And I, and, and now that you're saying this, I'm feeling a little bit of guilt because I seem to remember you asking me uh, for the notes from that hmm. talk. And I'm not sure I ever came through. Huh. And I bet you I could find them. Um, yeah, I do remember a lot, uh, about that. And it, I think part of it was we had on one side of the backboard, um, these basic philosophic questions, what is real, what is good, what is true, what is beautiful, right? Mm. Mm. Then these other more personal questions that had to do with my self, uh, am I lovable? You know, what am I supposed to do with my life? Um, there's a couple more like that, you know, and, and this idea that when you show up in a new place, this it's universal. It will occur to a human being, no matter what age you are. I could be different, you know. I could be a different person here because um, it's a whole new new start, right? And I feel very positively disposed toward that impulse. I think it's a noble impulse, a desire for transformation, you know. And and woe to the person who doesn't have it. I think. You know, so I wanted to 
normalize that a little bit with everyone there that going, know they were feeling it, you know, because you could not and say, that's, let's run with that. And so what's the, what is the end game? And for me, I think I read a little bit from, hang on, I think I might have the book. Uh, oh, no, I probably have it at home, Tashin. Um, I couldn't. Uh, I, I wish I had thought of that. But anyway, um, a book called "Words in Their Ways" by Sloan is the last. It, it's it's a skinny little book that just is a delight from beginning to end about playing with the roots, the Greek roots, the Latin roots of different words that we use that describe being happy or being uh, having an interesting life. You know. Um, and so I remember reading something about that, that if you're going to be interested in these questions, people are going to think you're strange and just sort of be okay with that. You know, um, there's a certain kinds of tensions. If you're really going to be yourself, that you have to just decide that's, a, that's in fact a sign that you're doing the right thing, that this tension, and it was maybe connected to addiction counseling because they used to tell us at clinics, if you're not making them mad, you're not helping them. Hmm. And so when certain things need to fall away for the better self to emerge. It's not pain-free. And so to be an agent of change in that is involves uh, having tension. And even if it's just you and yourself, you're going to, people are going to be like, what the hell's wrong with you? Hmm. And be able to hear that question and not flinch so much as, as you get older, you know? Um, and so for me, the mantra was love the truth and follow wherever it leads. And, and, and I think of truth, capital T, like there's truths, not just about me, but about the way life is and my relation to it. And, um, and it takes courage then to put our other agenda aside, like the uh, samurai. Mm. You know? <laughs> not just, it's not like how many needs don't matter, but they're part of something big. You know, anyway, so that, if I'm remembering right, um, and I think reading from that book, and maybe there was one or other book that I thought had some really cool stuff in it. Because um, typically after those little talks, people would say, what's that book again? Tell me that book. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I should get it. It's one of those gems. I, whenever I go into a used bookstore, I'm always on the lookout for another copy. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very hard to find them, but you can get them on Amazon. But it used to be they were cheaper. Now they're harder to find. I, the last time I checked, it was, you know. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so, but there may be more because I had two or three different versions of that. Um, let me write myself a note to, uh, to, to scope out my old notes uh, mm -hmm. from St. John's. Um, yeah. That was a real, that was a real puzzle piece moment for me, I think. Uh... It just and it was, it was still surprising me because it was such a 180 shift but i was like oh this guy's this guy's off to something and i remember asking some of my friends who i was like oh did you did you hear that talk by that jerry guy and they're like yeah it was fine or whatever you know uh, but i was like no yeah, that yeah. was that was what were you at the same talk as me and like <laughs> uh it was really good and um yeah and then of course that's that's what made me want to go see you too was just to uh i was like oh yeah, yeah I, I like this guy i like what he's on about i think i should go talk to him yeah, those other guys are like, yeah, what a doofus, huh? <laughs> you know, uh, I just, you know, the, them that have ears to hear, you know, I, for whatever reason, my ears were open to hear what you had to say, and which is surprising, but there it was. And uh, your credit, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was uh, very much inspired and 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 impressed with your uh, openness to things. You know, I think I know you've been sort of revealing your own path all along as you do stuff and you post stuff. Um, but that's, uh, and you're probably writing something that's going to be more about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming. But uh, like taking people along on your journey, to me, is the only way to go, you know? Like, not like, oh, let me tell you what I figured out. It's more like, um, let me tell you how in my haphazard, half-baked, uh, dumbass attempts at life this is what seems to have it's taking me i still you know? learned a thing or two <laughs> yeah. and, 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 in spite and of myself 
provisionally. It's good yeah. subject to change. Yeah, right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you have very kindly shared so much of your story and answered my questions. I wonder, is there anything else you'd like to talk more about or uh, ask or share? Um, I guess one of the ways I frame how I approach each day that that the more I do this, the better off I am. Um, and when I don't do it, it's, you know, I'm just tossed by the wind and the waves. <laughs> Is I, I like to think of in terms of uh, abundance versus scarcity, um, and I like to uh, I think okay, when I'm feeling a sense of abundance, all is well, um, and from what do I derive then a sense of abundance? And when I'm feeling a sense of scarcity, everything is harder and exhausting. And what is it that makes that happen? You know, and um, and it's not and and it's it can be just as like oh I got I got money in my pocket I'm feeling a sense of abundance I can go buy lunch if I feel like it. That's not insignificant, um, but it's not the main thing. And uh, and I started to learn that in India because you know when you're in these difficult environments, third world places, there's all sorts of stuff you don't have, right? Like I joked about Oreos, but you know like. You could, if you start from the from a position of scarcity, that is, here are all the things that I like having in my life, and and three quarters of them I don't have when I'm in India, right? Ah, it sucks, doesn't it? You'll you'll feel that way that that way of doing it. And someone in India helped me scope this out. They said, no, start from the bottom, and you say, what do you have? Well, I have a bag. I have plenty of money. I have about 20 pounds of clothing that's perfectly sufficient, for whatever I need. I'm all right, you know? Um, so the bottom-up approach was way better and fostered a sense of abundance. Um, and it also made me less in a hurry, like, oh, I'm okay. And I noticed that when I'm feeling a sense of scarcity, I'm like energetically moving faster and going all over, you know? Um, and so I learned... Those, those, there's a unity to all those kinds of things that, it, and and if I'm attentive to it, I, I, I don't become as exhausted. Hmm. You know? um, and so, and it also connected to the sense of abundance, the sense of gratitude. And if there's one secret formula for feeling a sense of well-being in life, it's fostering a sense of gratitude you know and i didn't i i didn't have a great idea about that because it seemed to me for a while that that was just being sort of naive and you know because doesn't life suck isn't life suffering isn't all this stuff happening to us all the time and someone always has their hand in your wallet you know like no sooner do you get some money in the bank that you got to pay 500 bucks to fix your car you know like all that kind of stuff um, but no, um, yeah, just, uh, uh, the kind of gratitude that I came to understand was that for myself was gratitude, fostering a sense of gratitude is a pleasure seeking experience hmm. that it, it awakens the part of me that takes pleasure for granted. So the opposite of addiction. Addiction is the process of losing pleasure. Something that I makes me feel good is now getting harder to experience because tolerance is going up and it's getting harder to enjoy because dependence is rising and that makes me feel uncomfortable without it. You mm. know, so the level of discomfort without it is increasing. The level of sweetness with it is getting harder to get. Look at the writing on the wall. Pleasure is fleeing. Well, I think right. I remember you talking about this in that talk, actually, and that that was part of what made an impression on me was that. Oh, really? I, if I if I if I remember correctly, it might have been at a different time, but I, I felt like it was honest. You know, it was honest. It was like, hey, you enjoy these things, you know, because in the dare education that I received in middle school or whatever, they're like, no, oh, this is just terrible and bad, and like you're gonna die. And it was like, well, you know, mm, obviously know. false, right? Obviously yeah. false. But you were like, no, yeah, it is enjoyable. And you're not actually going to enjoy it over time. It's going to be less and less 
enjoyable and don't you want to enjoy life and it kind of met me where I was as I was like oh yeah I think I think you're right I don't enjoy that as much as I used to and you know uh it was it was more real uh than uh, cool. yeah you're right and I, I'm glad you remembered that because that's that would have been something I would have tried, wanted to talk about I'm sure mm -hmm. yeah it's it's sort of the difference between a natural high and artificial high a natural high requires effort and you some part of you that's invested in it and you don't get it right away it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a, a uh, it's a benefit from that you get you get it with interest later on you know the dividends come after there's been an investment of yourself for a while um, whereas an unnatural high artificial high would be you get it all right away like a credit card mm -hmm. you know and you have to pay it back with interest mm -hmm. and so while it's really nice to spend some money on a credit card you get something right now you're going to pay mm -hmm the cost to that kind of pleasure that in and that's the hard part if it's down the road you know delayed gratification is quite the challenge for any animal what works for you in your life to cultivate gratitude and the sense of abundance um i think i have to in, make intentional uh times to ponder it and write about it in my journal it's one of the benefits of the discipline of a journal that if I'm just sit, sitting there with the thing open, I naturally now go to those themes, you know? Um, and uh, without that, I think if I just had to sort of trust on my own brain to pluck out of thin air, hmm. uh, thoughts of gratitude. Although um, I do, when I'm feeling discomfort in any way, um, there is a little now mental connection that I'll go, okay, what's, how can I think about this in a, in a, in a way that fosters gratitude? Um, you know, like the car thing, like I got this car, it's about 20 years old, but I love it. You know, mm -hmm. it gets me around. It's basically works well, but I just got a, the word from the dude in the garage. It's got about a thousand dollars worth of, uh, repairs need maybe more. Mm -hmm. They could even 15 hundred and i'm like damn it all and they have that money in my pocket <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know and and but then i'm like okay boy has it been a wonderful thing to have this car you know i have my little military mattress in there take a nap whenever i want you know um it hauls crap everywhere i go it's just a minivan you know without the seats in it um it's been a real blessing to me in my life to have this car mm -hmm. and as soon as i'm dwelling on that i am feeling warm feelings better and i'm and i can look at that car and feel good about it rather than you're taking fifteen hundred dollars from me mm -hmm. and, you know just to keep you rolling you son of a gun mm -hmm. yeah so there is a i think i have developed some habitual connections to thinking that way but i think my journaling is the, is really the best the best um most most reliable way i have to to take a focused make that a focused mindset you know mm -hmm. um plus i just walking helps me i walk a lot and i take long walks and um and to do like i have this eight mile route around annapolis which i don't maybe do once a month and i have a few four mile things i'll do then i'll call christine to come pick me up mm -hmm you know that's enough um but those but walking the one of the primary benefits of that for me besides physical is that it forces you to deal with the monotony of walking and thinking and having no easy distraction i don't use earbuds i don't like using earbuds for anything hmm. uh, if i'm sitting in a coffee shop and writing and i don't like the noise level I, i'll put some in you know um, but uh, exercise, I want to feel what my body can do and can't do. I don't want to, I can understand why people would use earbuds though. Like you, you need to get fit and it helps you to do more, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that's not my only reason for doing exercise. So like I, I'd like to be in touch with what my body really can do, you know? And if here's the edge where I'm uncomfortable, just go a little bit more. That's a good day, mm. you know?
I'm okay with that. I have the geezer workout now, man. I'm telling you, I don't, the, my 20 year ago self would be laughing very hard at my mm -hmm. current exercise regimen. Mm -hmm. I have a friend and we work out and we call we do call it the geezer workout, a little bit of strength stuff, not a lot. And the first thing we'll do is these like uh, dumbbell, you know, little poles, you know, and we do it very briefly. It's like a, it's like a 20 minute workout. And he'll he'll grab the dumbbell. It's the first thing we're doing. And he'll look up and say, it's almost over. <laughs> and we think, yeah, it is almost over. Let's, let's do this, you know? <laughs> That's funny. But we never would have said that before. We did two at workouts a day, an hour and a half each, you know, do all the, do the legs, do the this, do the that. Like, uh, no, no, no. Hmm. You mentioned your journal. Do you have any intentions to write something any any books coming in the future for us from jerry this is a source of frustration i have about a dozen half written essays hmm. and i just can't seem to energetically finish them hmm. and i don't know really uh what the answer is going to be my the answer seems to be for me don't work anymore hmm. i can't work i don't we're not financially solvent enough to do that you know hmm. um so like i work i have been able to have it so like i only see clients in the mornings so by noon i'm done i'm here at like 6 a.m done by noonish maybe one sometimes um and then ideally go exercise and then go right but i just want to go home and take a nap really mm -hmm. sometimes i don't get to do the exercise or the writing and so i haven't i haven't found a good solution for that yet i feel like i have a lot on my head and i think about it a lot and i and i'll wake up in the middle of the night and i'll scribble scrabble something you know i got it and i'll look at that for like two weeks and just keep working it over working it over and then i don't finish so yeah i think the answer is yes i i do have a strong desire to because it's the way i think things through you know as do you i think right like mm -hmm. without the the help of your fingertips putting it on paper or typing it um thinking is a lot less uh diligent if you can't write a good sentence about it, you don't really understand what you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, and you can think you do in your head when you're just thinking it. Oh, I, I think I'm thinking something and I, what is it? I write it down. It makes no sense on the page. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't really understand what I'm thinking and feeling, you know, and you, and you write 20 versions of that paragraph and then it starts to sound like you're understanding something. Mm -hmm. Experience. Yeah. I think that is my whole intent on on journaling and writing and ever sharing it with anybody is that this is uh, how I'm figuring myself out. And most of the things we talked about today came from me scribble scrabbling about it and, and starting to take shape with what's going on here, you know? Absolutely. Um, when I told you that story of, of, of selling the t-shirts and having this thing happened to me and then you know six months later meeting this guy in new york city that it, it woke it up again um i didn't connect those two for several years those two experiences even though it was they were so connected um but because the time gap it took me time thinking about it and then wanting to write about it and figure out what was going on and then what pleases me is some of these little connections that you that you just have to look at it long enough. Say, what is the story here? You know, what is the the arc of something being felt and then problematic and then being resolved? You know, and the fact that this guy's T-shirt gave me a message, and I'd been selling T-shirts in the beginning, tickled me to no end when it and, and when it first occurred, and I was like, I didn't, ever, I never even made that connection for a long time, hmm. like awesome <laughs> it was so pleasing i don't know why it would be but it was it, it makes me feel i understand that there's a unity to what's going on that, that you know that the, the me that was six months later six months before the same guy having the same experience that matters together it says there's this just like being a little boy like the little boy you and you now same kid you know and that 
it adds the, the understanding of the meaning of it. You know, like if it was, if there were a lot of these disconnected things in my life that, what the hell is it? How does one thing relate to the other if it ever did? Um, I don't know how to pull it all together apart from writing. I'm sure there are plenty of people who can just think their way into it. Mm. Um, but but when you get the stroke of connection, it's so gratifying, I think, you know, for me. Um, Definitely. I think that um, I'm just having the sense of how much, um, you know, this that you're talking about with writing and, uh, you know, what we talked about with substances and addiction and um also you know travel and and learning there's there's so much stuff that made such an impression on me from our relationship uh back in the day and it's been yeah it's been really lovely to get to know you better and uh hear your whole life story in one one go and uh dive deeper into some things and really appreciate you taking the time jerry to speak oh. with me friends for life bud mm. amen even if i don't see you for a while i know you're doing what you're supposed to do mm. Beautiful. You know, that is comforting to me. Hmm. Here's one last thing I'll tell you about work. I'll just show you. I'm sure, I bet you saw this. It used to be in my office at the college. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm classic. a fourth stooge. <laughs> yeah, the fourth stooge. That's Jerry. Uh, oh, man. Are you still hmm. playing basketball? Oh, I never played basketball. That was... Uh... I think our mutual friend Tommy was more into it. I mean, I played it a little bit in intramurals, but I basically I never. I thought I you was were really basketball. active in it. No, no, and I was you not. were good, man. You were you had, you were an impact player. I I I I think at that you you must be misremembering Jerry. I've never. Been. I am not because here's Michael Fogelman uh -huh. playing defense. <laughs> Used to do your fingers. Oh like my that. gosh! Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, and I think that had an effect. Huh. People are like, what? what the hell is he doing? Let's go over here. <laughs> I guess. I, I know I went to the intramurals because it was, I don't know, it was, uh, I enjoyed it, but physical coordination, especially at the time, was not. I've gotten more physically coordinated over time, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you this, though. Uh, basketball, I admire what goes on at that college when there are all sorts of people who've never played and go to play. Because mm. it's not an easy sport to just jump into. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, horseshoes or something like that we chuck something like it's easy to be embarrassed in basketball you know you get hit in the chest with the ball or on the head it instantly makes everyone laugh you know mm -hmm. like you can do this like and miss the ball and I, I in the pros even man if someone gets hit on the head with the ball mm -hmm. everybody laughs mm -hmm. it doesn't happen that often <laughs> that's like a major embarrassment in basketball is to get hit on the head um so anybody who does that and you did not look like someone who had never played basketball ever. I'm telling you. Well, that's news to me. News thank to you me. the old Polish boy. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jerry. It's been great speaking with you, friend. Oh, you're welcome. You got it, bud. Um, thank you for your patience and uh, and your interest at all. It's like uh, very satisfying to me that I have anything to say that matters. Mm. You know? A true pleasure. <laughs>